everybody. Thank you so much for watching. This is our last service online for the month of May 2020. I don't know when you're watching this message, but if it's in 2027 or 28 or 2040, uh, in 2020, from March until right now, we were under a world pandemic, global pandemic, and all of our services have been online. And this is our last service in the month of May online. I want to say thank you for watching. We are just about to start with some worship, and I'm excited to worship with all of you online as we engage in worship. I'm, I'm blown away by technology and the ability for our church to continue worshiping together, even though we're not in the same room. But I believe those days are shorter that we are not in the room than they have been. The days are coming. In fact, I'm going to open up and tell you a little bit about our phases right now. Um, we are entering into next week what we're calling phase one here at Revolve Church, which means uh, we are still meeting online. Uh, however, our dream team of volunteers are being selected, a very small number of them, to participate in a live studio audience setting for us to record these messages. We will record them, and, and praise God, it won't just be me and a camera. Uh, it'll be me and a few other people in our worship team and a few other people in the room, live studio audience, recording what we will continue to show on Sunday. It is my hope that very soon, uh, perhaps early as July, we will enter into phase two of our regathering plan. Phase two includes family style services. Here's what that means. You will come to church if you're comfortable and sit with your family maintaining socially distant spaces. Uh, and, and we are super hopeful that that's going to happen as early as July. Now, we are redesigning the service. We've asked our volunteers what elements should be there, what elements should not be there. And we're going to design a service that we really feel like will keep your children engaged for those of you that feel comfortable. Now, I do realize that some of you do not feel comfortable and will not feel comfortable coming into a gathering public setting among a lot of other people even in July. And our plan right now, my son is building a list of equipment that we will need, a streaming service that will allow us to stream the service live. What we've been doing up until now is recording and simulating a live stream, all right? But it's our hope that when we open up our doors on Sunday morning for families to come and worship with us, we will be streaming that in your living room so that you can watch it at home while you feel unsafe participating. And we totally understand if you're not ready. And we're going to do everything we can to provide you with everything we offer here at our church. So stay tuned. Now, phase three will be when we will open up our children's ministry rooms. We will not do that until Durham Public Schools has deemed it safe for children to return to the classroom. So we know it will not be before that. But I'm excited because we are getting close. I want to just give you a couple of quick announcements before we jump into worship this morning. Last week was a do-it-yourself service. <laughs> Whoa, uh, I probably won't ever do that again because half of the people that I surveyed loved it and half of the people, <laughs> they didn't like it at all. And it was a different kind of service. I literally outlined, you can go back and watch it on our YouTube channel, exactly how you would do a service in your home, and I ask you to do service yourself, all right? But I'm not doing that again, so don't worry if you hated it. If you liked it, stay tuned. I'm going to add some of the elements to some of the services in the future. I believe with all of my heart that as a pastor, I'm called to equip you to lead yourself in some capacity of worship, some capacity of the healthy disciplines of a follower of Jesus. All right, I just won't do the whole service again like that for those of you that didn't like it. Another thing that you need to know is our small groups next week, the first week of June, are pressing pause. This is normal for us. We have always operated our small groups on a semester calendar. So we we start them and stop them on semester calendars. And we're ending this semester next week, and we will relaunch a new semester July the 12th. Now, I believe in July some groups will begin meeting again in person, but we are still going to offer virtual groups for those 
that are unable to attend in person because maybe you travel or maybe you're unable to get to the location in time from work, before work, or after work, and we're going to provide that. Or maybe you just don't feel safe meeting together. But new groups will launch July the 12th. And I'm inviting you, if you would like to lead a group, please send me an email, jeff at revolvechurch.com. I would love to help you lead a group. The next thing is so exciting. Yesterday was actually our first one of these. It's outdoor events. We have many of them planned for the entire month of June. We're even trying to plan more right now on into July. And these are events where you can come with us outside in an outside setting and socially distance, safe a distance away from people, but we can see one another. We just had one yesterday where we had biscuits over here at our parking lot at Northgate Mall, and it was awesome. And I hope that you'll go to revolvechurch.com slash gatherings and take a look at the ones we have coming up. We have a drive-in movie night. We have an outdoor sit on the lawn at, at the farm movie night. We're actually doing a night of worship, and I cannot wait to see many of you at these outdoor events. Now, what I want to ask you to do is ask you to open up your heart right now all over the internet. I want you to just sort of pray this prayer. Dear Lord, open up my heart. Even though I can't be in the room with my friends and my church family, Lord, would you open up my heart that I can worship with them together online? Would you open up my heart that I could hear the word of God together online? Right now, Lord, would you do something in my heart? And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship everybody. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am. Cause I need to know Oh, and you say I am loved When I can't feel a thing And you say I am strong When I think I am weak And you say I am held When I am falling short And when I don't belong Oh, I believe what you say of me. I believe the only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. You'll have every failure, God, 
Awesome. I love worshiping. I can't wait to worship in person, but man, this online worship really helps, especially in this season. If you've been around for a while, you know we've been in this season called Ephesus. I've literally been going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, the letter that Paul writes to the region of Ephesus of all of these churches. And, and today I'm super excited to get pretty close to the end of Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to open it up to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 10. But before we go any further, I want all of you right now in the chat window to tell us where are you watching from. If you're in Durham, Raleigh, Creedmoor, Bahama, Rougemont, Timberlake, wherever it is that you're from, I want you to tell me where you're at right now in your house or in your car. Are you on the porch? Are you in the bedroom? Are you in the living room? Are you on the kitchen? Where are you? Not just in the city and the location, but what location in your place? Where are you? Are you driving down the road? You should be watching this if you're driving down the road. And say hello right now to a couple of people online that you know are watching with you, all right? This is our sort of meet and greet, if you will, because meet and greet is probably gone from the church forever. We will probably never high five in the church in a public setting. We'll never invite strangers to high five other strangers in a room. That'll probably never happen again, all right? We may do the elbow or the fist bump. I don't know. Who knows what the future actually uh, looks like. But today, we're going to be in this book, Ephesians uh, chapter 6. We're going to be in the 10th verse, and I'm going to cover about four verses. But I want to start by telling you just a little story. I have four children. Most of you probably know that about me. At this time of the recording, they are 15 years old, 10 years old, 8 years old, and 6 years old. Boy, 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 girl is our baby. And my two middle boys, two middle sons, Brayden and Jacob, they, they recently fell in love with football. And I remember a couple of years ago explaining to them football. And I was explaining to them the difference between offense and defense. And they didn't really know that the defense, this was when they were younger, they didn't understand that the defense is actually trying to stop the offense from scoring. And they didn't know that when the offense is the ones that had the ball. And the objective, right, the goal is to get the ball into the goal line. And the defense is to prevent that from happening. And the offense, their job is to get the goal, the ball into the goal. That's the whole role. And I, I explained that a little bit to them. Today, as we look into God's Word, I want to I remind you of something. Of the Christian faith in this life following Jesus, there's an offense but there's also a defense. We, we are called to live a defensive life and a defensive posture, but we're also called not to just defend the enemy. We're called to score and run up the score, I happen to believe. I'm reminded of a story. The year was, gosh, it must have been 2000 and, uh, two, two, 2002. And I had just arrived in Charleston, South Carolina. Matter of fact, it was 2003. I lived in Charleston for a few months with the United States Air Force, and I got deployed overseas. I got sent to Saudi Arabia. We were pre preparing to launch the attack on Iraq. You, you should probably know about that story if you were alive during that time. And anyway, I was in Saudi Arabia, and I, I lived there for about seven months, and I worked 
on the flight line, and my job was to put cargo on airplanes or passengers on airplanes and to send them to various destinations, all right? And so we had this big, huge, we called it the pallet yard. And what it was, was it was this big, huge sand pit area about the size of seven or eight football fields. It was just as, you could just, it was just cargo for days you could see cargo. And one day, I'd gotten a request for a piece of cargo to be delivered to an airplane. And so I pulled out my handy dandy sheet and I looked, okay, it's in the pallet yard and it was separated by grids and, and rows. And so I knew it was on this row and it was way away from the warehouse. And so I thought, you know what, it's nice enough outside today, I'm just going to walk out there. So I walked out there to this, uh, look for this piece of cargo that I needed to take to this airplane. And I walked out there, part of my job was to inspect it and make sure that it was ready. Well, on my way out there, um, I, I ran into a couple of my co-workers and they were doing something looking for cargo. And anyway, as we got close to the cargo that we were looking for, that I was looking for, all of a sudden I looked up and there was this massive sandstorm and it literally looked like from about a hundred yards away fog was moving towards us and at a rate that everything that I could see was slowly disappearing and I it was getting close and it was getting closer and closer faster and faster and just like the snap of a finger this sand is now pelting me in the face and I have literally grabbed a, a hold of a net we had nets that secured the cargo to these big huge pallets and and I was holding on to a net and I couldn't see anything and I was just just holding on and I felt something grab my leg and and there was somebody else had had ducked down and they couldn't get to the net on the cargo so they had grabbed a hold of my leg and literally I'm standing in this sandstorm and it's all I can do to stand up and I'm holding on and I am literally struggling to stand up and I was thinking about that story as I prepared this message in the Christian faith sometimes we're just going through life and out of nowhere, a sandstorm pops up. And my question is, do you know what to hold on to so that you can stand firm in this life? Because the Christian faith is calling us, and that's what we're going to learn today, how to stand firm against the strategies of the enemy. There's an enemy that's trying to take us out. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're actually opening up the armor of God. All right. For some of you, this is a refresher. For some of you, you've never heard it. But, but I want to jump into this word because I think that many times in the Christian faith, we see people disappear or drift from the faith because a sandstorm showed up and they were not properly, adequately equipped to stand firm. Well, God's Word tells us that we aren't only called to stand firm, we are capable of standing firm. And I want to help you with that. I want to help you stand firm against everything that the enemy would throw at you. So if you're ready right now and you want to learn from God's Word how to stand firm, that's what I've titled my message, How to Stand Firm firm. How to stand firm. I want you to type right now. Say, I'm ready in the comments right now. I want you just to type it and say, I am ready. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Here's what the Bible says. A final word. This is Paul, his final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm in all against all strategies of the devil for we he's talking to faithful followers remember we learned this last week this letter was written to faithful followers for we faithful followers are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies you're not fighting against your mother-in-law your father-in-law your ex-husband the child the parents of the children that you adopted you're not fighting against your landlord your employer your co-worker you're not fighting anyway i can't preach that right now but you need to get that we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, somebody type in the comments right now, therefore, 
Anytime you see therefore in the scriptures, you need to know what's it there for, right? What's it there for? Because you're not fighting against Bubba and Joe. You're not fighting against people. You are fighting against rulers of dark worlds and evil spirits. Because of that, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Wow. Here's what God's word is telling us. There's a battle. But you can stand firm against it, and you can stand firm after it. There's a battle, and you have everything you need, and put it on. So I want to unpack these verses, just verse by verse. Verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Now listen, that is not the toughen up buttercup kind of strength it's talking about. You know what I'm saying? If you've had a kid, man, I have four kids, and every time they fall or scrape their knee or get hurt, I'm like, toughen up, buttercup. Come on, strengthen up. you got to get strong. Come on, strengthen up. Toughen up, buttercup. That's not what this is talking about. Paul is saying, you got to be strong in the Lord. It's not toughen up, buttercup, cliche. And here's the truth. You've probably heard this or said this to somebody. you just got to fight through it. And I think in some things that's very true. You just got to fight through it. But in most things, spiritually speaking, when the sandstorm shows up, you don't need to fight through it. You need to faith through it. Stand strong in the Lord. Stand strong. My faith is in the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. The most dangerous place for a person of faith to be is not in a difficult season. That's not the the most dangerous place. In a COVID or coronavirus, national, global pandemic, that's not the most dangerous place for a person of faith. A person of faith, the most dangerous place for a person of faith is any place that they think, I got this. I can handle this. I can get through this. That's the most dangerous place. When we think we are strong enough Apart from the Lord, we are in a dangerous place. Be strong in the Lord. Verse 11 says, put on all of God's armor. Why? I love this. God answers the why question before we ask it. So you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Put on. Let me unpack this a little bit. Listen to me. Putting it on and putting it on the shelf is different. Put on all of God's armor. Put on all of God's... Listen to me. Putting it on and putting it on the shelf is different. you got to put it on. All of it. Putting all of it on and putting some of it on is different. You can't put some of it on. He said put all of it on. On the next couple of weeks, I'm going to teach you the whole armor of God and how you can put it on, how you can put it on, all of it. Not part of it. Verse 12 goes on, says, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, against evil rulers and authorities, unseen world, mighty po- Therefore, put it all on. I want to read verse 13 and unpack two things, defense and offense. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist. Resist is to stop. Resist. If you're resisting, somebody's trying to, to offense. They're trying to score in football. They're trying to, and you want to resist that. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. This is defense so that you will be able to resist the enemy in a time of evil. That's our defense. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. This is our offense. We stand firm. Offense. Let me explain this just a little bit. 
offense in the Christian faith and defense in the Christian faith. Let me talk about a couple of things that we do here at Revive Church. Weekly worship together. When we worship together, can I tell you what we're doing? It's offense. This is offense. We are advancing the kingdom of God when we lift up the name of Jesus. We are advancing the kingdom of God through offense, through worshiping. When you serve in the church, our dream team, about 75 volunteers that serve in the body of Christ. Not only is that something fun to do and good to do, it's a command from God's word. He says, I've given you a gift. And when I I give you a gift, it's so you can build up the church. And when you serve in the church, you're on offense. You're scoring on the devil. Literally, you're scoring on the dark world by serving in the church. Hey, when you give to the church, you're advancing the mission of Revolve Church to introduce God to the people. To, let me say this right. To introduce people to God and His purpose for their life. Or I can say it this way. To introduce God to people and God's purpose to their life. Either way you want to say it. When your generosity through giving happens, you are offense. We are scoring own the devil. Healthy relationships, our small groups. I know I said they're about to stop next week. They're going to start back. But when you get in them, can I tell you something? When you participate in a small group, you're on defense and you're on offense. And if you're leading one, you're advancing the kingdom of God. If you're participating in one, you're sort of on defense spiritually. Let me make this make sense. You're, you're getting stronger spiritually as you discuss God's word with other people, healthy relationships. And what's happening there is you're learning how to be strong and stand firm and defend what the world is throwing at you, what the enemy is throwing at you. So that could be offense and defense. Devotion to God through Bible study and prayer. I teach you. I beg you. Read God's Word regularly. Devote your life to reading God's Word. Devote your life to having a time of prayer with God. That is offense and defense because sometimes God's Word will speak to you and it'll cause you to do something to advance the kingdom. Sometimes God's Word will get in your heart and and prepare you and equip Equip you. We're going to learn about this in a couple of weeks to to fight when the enemy shows up, def- to defend the enemy and his attack. Even Jesus did this. Jesus was tempted out in the wilderness. And he didn't strategize on his own. He cut the enemy with the word of God. And if you're going to quote the Word of God, you're going to have to know the Word of God. And if you're going to know the Word of God, you're going to have to pick up the Word of God. But a lot of times we see Christians in the Christian faith neglect the Word of God, not know the Word of God until they're in the battle. And sometimes it's too late for the defense. And that's what defense does. It does is when we plant churches, you know that we we plant churches through Revive Church. We give resources to help other churches plant. That's offense. We're sending new churches into new communities, new neighborhoods that we could grow and expand the kingdom of God. I hope that this is making sense to you. The spiritual life is one of offense where we're called to expand. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Did you know God is not in heaven waiting to release his kingdom? He's in heaven waiting on you and me to release his kingdom, to bring offense, to grow the kingdom of God by inviting people to church, by sharing our faith, by giving to the church, by serving in the church, by loving people in our community. Jesus said that the world will know your following me by the way you love one another to advance the kingdom through offense. But if you follow Jesus, you got to get this. If you follow Jesus, listen to me, you will have trials. You will have sand storms. You will have offense trying to score against you strategies of the devil. And so you need a strong defense. These verses are really simple. And I just want to unpack them for you, man. I, if you can't tell, I am so eager to preach to a crowd of people, but I'm going to preach to this camera because I know you're watching it. I know this is helping you. I know that God's Word says when it is preached, it will not return void. And some of you are going to grow in your defense this week. Some of you are going to grow in your offense this week. Some of you in your spiritual life, you're going to advance the kingdom in greater levels. And some of you are going to be able to stand firm against whatever comes your way this week because of this teaching but let me just give it to you simple 
I, I believe these verses are pretty simple. I'm a simple guy. And I believe they're simple, and I just want to give it to you simple because I think it's going to help you. I really do think it's going to help you. First things first, there's an enemy. There's an enemy. He's strategizing against you, and he's trying to stop you. The second thing, pretty simple. The enemy is not other people. The enemy is not your job. It's not your boss. It's not your coworker. It's not... Your family member is not your ex. It's not the person married to your ex. It's not who you think it is. The enemy is evil rulers of dark worlds. The enemy is not other people. But if we stand strong in the Lord, we can stand against the enemy and we will stand after the attack. That's a good word. You ought to type that up right now. That's a good word. But what does it ever even mean? How many times in church has somebody said, that's a good word, but what does it mean? How do I apply it to my life? And that's what I want to help you in today. I want to help you because it is a good word. We can stand against the attack and we can stand after the attack if we stand strong in the Lord. Well, how do we do that? And I want to help you with that. I'm going to teach you about the armor of God over the next few weeks. That's what we're going to be talking about, the armor of God. Every piece is important, but it's important that you have every piece. The Bible says put on the armor of God. How do we stand strong in the Lord? I'm only going to give you one step today. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to give you two more steps. The first step is be aware of the enemy. Be aware of the enemy. There's an enemy, and you have to be aware. If you don't know who the enemy is, you'll attack the wrong person, or you'll stand firm against the wrong thing because you don't know who the enemy is. You have to be aware of the enemy. Next week, I'm going to teach you how to be armed with the right weapons. And then the week after that, I'm going to teach you how to be adamant in prayer. But today, be aware of the enemy. There's a battle. And if you don't know the enemy... You won't know who to defend against. And you won't know where to stand firm. And you won't know how to advance. Let me show you something that Paul writes. Paul, who wrote this letter to the region of churches all throughout Ephesus, as he's saying a final word, stand strong in the Lord. There's an enemy that's coming your way. Stand strong in the Lord. Let me show you. He identifies what is not the enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Paul says these words. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent the whole night and a day adrift at sea. See, Paul had all of these things happen to him. Notice this. He was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned nearly to death. He was shipwrecked. He was left at sea see adrift he was beaten but Paul knew that that wasn't the fight Paul knew that the battle was beneath being stoned the battle was beneath being beaten with rods the battle was beneath your co-worker offending you the battle was beneath your relationship that walked out on you the battle is beneath your job that you lost your finances that are falling apart your children that won't obey your the battle is beneath that and Paul is saying listen I had a bunch of things happen to me T maybe not coronavirus but I've been beaten I've been shipwrecked I've I've been stoned. I've been left adrift at sea to die. But that's not the battle. We have to stand firm in the Lord. COVID is not the fight. Coronavirus is not the fight. See, coronavirus attacks our health. The enemy is after our holiness. You got to catch this. Listen, the enemy wants your holiness. And I'm watching lots of people of faith right now that aren't even sick with coronavirus sacrifice their holiness out of fear and to protect their health. Because they don't know the battle and they don't know how to stand firm against the sandstorm. It's shown up in their life. Paul had all these things. Listen, job loss is not the enemy. Maybe you've lost your job. It's real, but it's not the enemy. Job loss affects your finances. The enemy wants your faith. And to stand firm in the Lord, we have to have strong faith. In the Lord, we can stand against the attack And in the Lord, we can stand after the attack. I want to give you basic three simple steps. Three very simple steps that will help you. Stand 
in the Lord. Because if we can stand in the Lord, we can stand against the attack and we can stand after the attack. The first step is this. Listen to me. Honest confession. Honest confession. Not just confession. Honest confession. Confession of your sin. What is it that you've done wrong? What is it that you've thought wrong? What is it that you've said wrong? And you need to honestly confess that. James actually says in God's Word that confess our sins to one another that we may find healing. Now listen to me. I'm not talking about confessing everything to everyone. You don't need to make a long social media post about all the things you've done, thought, and said wrong this week. That's not necessary. You need somebody that loves you and loves God that you can honestly confess your sins to. Confessing sin is not saying, look how bad I am. Confessing sin is saying, look what I don't want to continue doing. And you need friends. That's why we have small groups. You need friends that you can confess to. And you can share your honest confession. The second step to standing firm in the Lord is total surrender. Total surrender. I I wrote total surrender because I could have just said surrender because a lot of people want to surrender everything in their life except one little area. Their private internet surfing sessions. The way they balance their checkbook. The thing they do on their business trip. The way they look at others. They want to surrender everything but something. Total surrender. Not partial participation. No. No. Total surrender. I want to read a verse to you from the the mouth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will save it. What? If you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. The words of Jesus. Jesus demands and deserves a total surrendered life. We have to die to ourselves every day. For the rest of our life, total surrender, totally surrendered, daily surrendered, eternally surrendered. Totally. If you want to stand firm in the Lord, you got to surrender everything. Not an hour and a half on Sunday. Not even a tenth of your finances. All of your finances. Not the way you talk in front of certain people, but the way you talk in front of all people. Surrendered. Totally. He deserves it. Because he gave totally his life. And he didn't give part of his life for part of yours. He gave all of his life for all of ours. And we need to totally surrender so that we can stand One of the reasons we don't stand firm against the enemy is because there's a part of us not fully surrendered. And then here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. You need to seek wisdom. Seek wisdom. I'm going to read this verse to you from the book of Proverbs, the wisdom book. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says this, Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. How about that? That's pretty profound, isn't it? Getting wisdom is the wisest thing. In other words, seeking wisdom is the smartest thing that you can do. And whatever else you do, develop some good judgment. Verse 8, if you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her and she will honor you. Seeking wisdom is the smartest thing that you can do. Here's what I mean by that. You need to listen to the words I'm preaching to you. I'm trying to help you with wisdom from God's Word. You need a small group leader that you can seek wisdom from. When they start back up in July, you need to be in one. You need to lead one. And, and let me seek, seek some wisdom from God. You don't need to just seek wisdom from the preacher. Get a copy of God's Word and seek His Seek some wisdom. See, a lot of times... We want to seek wisdom from people that will tell us what we can get away with. But that's not wisdom. To seek wisdom, we need to seek wisdom from people that will tell us not what we can get away with, but how we can get close to God. Because we want to stand firm. There's an enemy. 
that wants your joy. There's an enemy that wants to steal your peace. There's an enemy that wants to take your faith. There's an enemy that wants your attention. But God sent His Son Jesus to totally surrender that you and I could totally surrender. So right now, I don't know what's going on in your mind. I want to help you. Next week, I'm going to help you. I'll help you be armed with the right weapons and help you be adamant in prayer in a couple of weeks after that. But right now, I want to help you be aware of the enemy. And I want to help you stand in the Lord. Maybe you're watching this right now and you know as soon as this is over, you need to call that friend of yours and you need to honestly confess. I've sinned. I don't want to continue this way. I've had to do that. I, I confess sin in my own life in my small group this week. Some of you wish you were there now, don't you? <laughs> I did, I confessed that. Let me tell you what I, I told my, my friends this week. That I had confessed some sin to my own children for the way I said something. Let me tell you what I felt when I confessed that sin to my children. And said, listen, I, I talked with a tone I should have never talked with. Let me tell you what I felt. I felt the to tangible presence of God's forgiveness. I felt His forgiveness touch my soul because I honestly confessed. Not saying, look how bad I am, but saying, look how I don't want to continue living I confess to sin. I'm totally surrendered. Maybe you're watching this right now and you, you don't really have a lot of sin coming to your life that you need to confess, but you know there's an area in your life that you haven't fully surrendered to God. I want to invite you right now to do that. Surrender everything. Totally, fully surrender your life. And seek some wisdom. I want to pray for you. If you're watching this right now and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to do that. I want to share the gospel with you. It's a very simple gospel. I don't believe it's complicated. Sin entered the world at Adam and Eve. When you were born, you entered a world full of sin. We're naturally sinners. The Bible says all of us. But the Bible says that that sin that separated us from God is, is only reconciled or made right through the payment by death. And Jesus came to fulfill that payment of death on the cross. But he didn't stay in the grave. He rose to life that you and I could not only surrender our life to a dead God, but we could live righteously to a God that had been risen to life. And I invite you, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, right now, no matter where you're watching, simple prayer. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross with your son Jesus for my sin. And today, I commit to live my life surrendered and serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you prayed that prayer right now, I want you to write in the comments. If you're watching on Facebook Live, I prayed that prayer. If you're watching on Church Online platform, I want you to raise your hand. There's a little button right there. Click, raise your hand. I committed my life to Jesus. If you're watching this on a replay, email me, jeff at revivechurch.com, and say, I surrendered my life. I want you to know something. That as a follower of Jesus, there's an enemy. And you need to be aware of him. But he's been defeated. And we can stand firm against his attacks. Because we're going to stand firm after his attacks. I hope this has blessed you. I hope that I'll see you again soon. May God bless you and keep you. Would you do right now with me something I'm going to do with my own family. And worship in this last song together. Oh,